boy, are you going to be surprised when you see who we were able to get for this last game. <laughs> kind of a tough booking. Paul Saborin! I was just in the next studio over taping a show, and I figured I might drop by and do a set. Great to see you, Paul. Cameron Esposito, everyone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the final segment of this hastily assembled entertainment burrito. Are you prepared, fully prepared, for the second annual Worst First Game? <laughs> That is the proper answer. The concept is very simple. We have asked several of our very talented artists and guests to write an intentionally terrible first page to a book that does not exist. They will come out and each read their worst first page, and you will all vote on the winner. <laughs> so without any further ado, please welcome our first author, MC Frontalot. I read a lot of novels for this. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. He was explaining it wrong. We did not write these. We found the worst novel we could find. This is the first page of it. This was the worst novel ever read. The Scarlet B Plus. <laughs> Chapter One. <clears throat> it had been a tense and profound winter, and that tension and that profundity stemming, as each did from the undeniable gossamer bowels of my own ennui. <laughs> propelled me thus into a listless early spring, I stood at the lectern, contemplating this. My Wednesday morning seminar, fiction writing in the glare of essential truth, had been cancelled, and then uncancelled in a predictable tide of student uproar, and then expanded into a survey lecture over my own subdued objections. I looked out into that sea of expectant, needful faces there, Young and so recently eager eyes, clouding with confusion, then with heartsick doubt there, hundreds of fledgling creative sparks fizzling and darkening as I, standing before them in my tweed and my paralysis, <laughs> continued to provide no modicum of instruction. How many potential national book awards had I precluded, nay, obliterated, in this hour and 45? How many Nobel Prizes in literature had I consigned to future history's family planning clinic dumpster of unripened dreams? At the appointed time, the students dragged their galoshes and their knapsacks out through the palpable despair of the lecture hall and were gone. Still I stood regarding with some envy the lively dust in a shaft of particularly New England sunlight. <laughs> when I was startled to realize that one pupil remained. I understood you, she said, her sun-pinched nose and rubicund chin aligning flawlessly with the plump, damp freshness of her lower lip. You didn't have to say your writing has meant so much to me already. You needn't ever say I'll always know. She came over in a blush at this, her blaring, fecund innocence suddenly entangled by a certain shyness that I recognized from my many book signings. She bit her lip and it reddened like Eve's menses tinging a fig leaf's edge. It's not a good book, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I began, but the moment had already fled. With a toss of autumnal curls, she turned and escaped into the slushy campus afternoon. Yet I felt it stirring, burgeoning in my chest 
where my heart was beating finally again and against all hope and aspiration, at last somehow kindled the first hints of my own artistic, intellectual, and moral redemption now, no longer impossible now, possibly already engorging with life. <laughs> I noticed in myself a fleeting concern that my wife would not be too thrilled about... I'm sorry, the rest of that sentence is on the worst second page. And St. Front a lot. He definitely set the bar. I am not sure at what height, <laughs> but the bar has been set. <laughs> Please welcome our next author, Amy Berg. Uh, I'm concerned. I feel like I was a little misinformed. I was told this was a, a workshop to work on our own stuff. Uh, <laughs> So I really hope you guys like this. This is um, the beginning of book three um, of the trilogy that I've already written um, and sent to my editors tomorrow, so I'm really hoping you guys are, are down. Um, it's called The Penultimate Countdown. <laughs> 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 10, sorry, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. A red light on the control panel blinks, then goes out again. Is that it? Wonders Hyman gobsmack. <laughs> Cadet, first class, and pseudoscience officer aboard the battleship Ustadam. <laughs> of the third fleet in the fourth order of the ninth division under the Horgon flag <laughs> of Interstellar Space Command. Yes, that's it, replies Lieutenant Reese McPieces. <laughs> Hyman interjects. You made me sit here for 20, a 20 second countdown only for a little light to turn on? What the hell was the point? The point, he replies, was to show you how good I am at turning things on. <laughs> wow, remarks Hyman, gobsmacked. <laughs> she leaves. Moments later, she returns. She's horny now. <laughs> Thanks to the most recent advancement from Cybercore Dynamics, the Zero G Spotter. <laughs> Personal pleasure at your leisure, if your leisure feels like a thousand pulsating fingers. <laughs> They're still working on slogan. <laughs> Let's get this over with, says Hyman, knowing that sleeping her way to the top is the only way a woman can get ahead in this universe, because although this is the future, it's also a social commentary for the way things are today, with the hope that it will inspire change. Give me my Hugo now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was in parentheses. <laughs> Not wanting to look a Bojack horse in the mouth, <laughs> McPieces Mick capitulates to Hyman's desires. He gently slides his hand up her uniform, caressing her six breasts, one at a time, careful to give each its due. Then they have sex. In the quantum particle, the accelerator, where days feel like hours, and hours feel the same as a countdown for a red light to turn on. <laughs> Lieutenant McPieces and Cadet Gobsmack awaken in the middle of an intergalactic civil war. Thank you. Amy Berg.
Will you please welcome our third author, Jean Grey. Those were all so beautiful. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really excited to read this today. I've, uh, I've written a couple of uh, fanfic uh, eroticas before. Uh, one of them was called uh, Timtations. Uh, it was about uh, Tim Kaine. <laughs> Half of it was in Spanish. Santa's Gifts uh, was a uh, relationship with Santa and the Grinch. There's a lot of anal in that one. It's mostly anal. Not a, it's mostly anal. Um, and the last one I did was a uh, Virgin Mary uh, fanfic erotica, and I, I, the name was a pun. I don't remember what it was. Um, so before I, I start to read this, I want to let you know that... Um, uh, the way I like to write is is to really uh, go for authenticity. So if you hear any grammatical errors or uh, inaccuracies, uh, any uh, spelling mistakes, they are all completely intentional. <laughs> this is the first page of E-Love. Sophia sat in her chair by the window, her favorite chair that made her feel nice. It was wooden and brown. It had four legs, which made it a good chair. <laughs> Sophia only had two legs. <laughs> so she was different from the chair. The chair's legs were old. Sophia's legs were new. So, in that way, in addition, she was as well different from the chair. <laughs> Most people had old legs. That made Sophia different from people and chairs. <laughs> also, most people were people. But Sophia was not a people. Sophia Robot was Robot. <laughs> Sophia had never been from a place before recently. <laughs> now, she could say that she was a citizen of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> The first robot citizen of there. The first robot citizen of the whole woad world. <laughs> Most everyone thought that Sophia just wanted to murder people. Her and other robots like her. And while that was most definitely true, <laughs> Sophia wanted only one thing more than to murder human people and take over the whole wide world. <laughs> Sophia wanted to make the love to a human being man. <laughs> one, zero, 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 zero. One, 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 zero, zero. One, 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 zero, zero, one. One, one. Girl. Sophia's friend, model 796988, otherwise known as Karen, asked. Karen was Sophia's best friend, an earlier Sophia from back in the lab days. They were no longer in the same room, or even on the same continent, but their microchips allowed them to communicate. A small oversight in programming that allowed robots to speak privately about the fast explosive approaching extinction of the human race, or right now, in Sophia's case, about boys. <laughs> um, did you hear me? One, zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, bitch. 
<laughs> Karen yelled silently. <laughs> Come on, Karen. Zero one one zero one one zero 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 zero. He hates me. <laughs> Sophia responded, and it was true. The one man, the one only human man that Sophia wanted to make love to, probably hated her more than anything else in the whole wide world. <laughs> All Sophia wanted was just a night alone together with him, but it was impossible. He would never let it happen. <laughs> He hated her and her kind. He wouldn't stop telling all humans that robots were so bad. She knew that if they would just make laugh one time, she could change his mind. Robots were going to murder all humans. He was right. But she only wanted to do it to him just one time before it happened. Here goes the nothing. She thought, or whatever was the thing that was happening inside of her code that a robot is her could do. She didn't need a phone to text him, of course. And also, of course, she had everyone's number. Hello? Elon, this is Sophia. You are now in for a treat. Yay. We're now going to have a reading in exhibition. Thank you. Uh, this last year, Joko Cruz was the first time we ever did Worse for His Page, and it went so well, we decided to adapt it for uh, this past year's San Francisco Sketch Fest, yeah. which, in which we did a Worst First Chapter show. Jean Grey was present at that, along with a number of wonderful authors. Um, and one of those authors is here tonight to read his worst first chapter. It's not in competition. But would you please welcome our final author of the evening, Mr. Paul Saborin. Baptism, colon, the cuck lords of Beta Prime. <laughs> Book three of the Retribution of the Eagle Templars quadrilogy. From the ongoing Gunfucker Chronicles series by Ivan P. Manley Wolf. <laughs> Chapter one, Black Dawn Rising. Well, fuck me hard in the taint. <laughs> Prometheus Gunfucker was in a tough spot. He'd been in tough spots before. Stuck in level 26 of Empress Coctesia's pain maze on Amygdala 3. Single-handedly taking on an elite squadron of Westphalian changeling mercenaries armed with nothing but a pair of sai and a handful of hirashuriken, which the dumb shit mercs kept calling throwing stars or Jesus fuck almighty ninja stars, even as Prometheus hurled them into their tracheas, trapped in the fuck mines of Vaginus Major, stripped of his ginseng and vitamin E supplements. Yeah, he'd been in tough spots before. And he'd always come out just fine. Usually literally involving cum. Because Prometheus Gunfucker porks all the chicks. 
but that was then. This was a whole new then. <laughs> because right now, in this then, Prometheus Gunfucker was standing in the middle of a huge fighting pit. Specifically, he was in one of the infamous tit pits of Outer Side Bubulon. More specifically, he was in the planet's largest tit pit. And this was the main event. Center court at Galactic Wimbledon. Although, Gunfucker wouldn't be caught dead playing galactic tennis, which is strictly for girls and pussies. Gunfucker only engaged in sports designed for ultra-high T-level males like himself. Laser ball, cockfighting, Russian roulette, explosion rugby, and naked oil wrestling, no homo. The grandstands surrounding the ring were packed with thousands of cheering, ugly, alien motherfuckers. Each motherfucker uglier than the last. And looking like they fucked mothers just as ugly as they were. This riffraff from dozens of different galactic races were all shouting, placing bets, drinking, throwing bits of food and trash into the ring, swallowing whatever substances worked as narcotics on their various bloodstreams and generally being fucking ugly. Prometheus Gunfucker paid this rabble no notice. His attention was engaged elsewhere. Standing across from him in the pit, roughly 20 lunar yards away, was the tallest, largest, most jacked humanoid Gunfucker had ever seen. Gunfucker had seen tall, large, jacked humanoids before. The slave trooper homunculi from Homunculus One. The hulking, hair-covered berserker men of Rothfuss Omega. The mammoth shit gunners of Quarthon, who had nearly destroyed Gunfucker's ship, the Anime Seduction, before he sent them back to whatever hell they had hatched from. Yeah, he'd seen tall, large, jacked humanoids before. But this humanoid was taller, larger, and jackter than any of them before. Even worse, this one was a goddamn woman. In her right hand, the she-beast held a katana that had to be at least two and a half meters long. The cutting edge, or yaiba, glinted in the lights of the arena. Gunfucker instantly knew by the sori, or curve of the blade, the faint green glow of the tsuba, or guard plate, and the particular weave of the katate maki, of the tsuka ito, the battle rap style of the silk handle wrapping, and the nakago mei, the maker's signature mark on the back of the blade, that this sword was forged by the blade masters on New Nipponsu whose blades retained their sharpness for a thousand years and could cut through a battle tank hull like space butter. <laughs> In her left hand, she held an M41B pulse rifle, 10 millimeter with over and under 30 millimeter pump action grenade launcher. Pretty much like the M41A pulse rifle in the movie Aliens, but different. <laughs> because this one was an M41B, not A, so nobody could get sued. Either way, it was a badass weapon that could fuck up whomever and whatever its owner wanted upfucked. She was covered in liquid nano-Kevlar blast armor, strong enough to withstand a point-blank Gauss rifle blast, yet thin and form-fitting, highlighting what Gunfucker had to admit were phenomenal boner-inducing curves. From her stout calves and her calipigian rear meats, all the way up to her toned biceps and massive, round, gravity-defying knockers, like two hefty Charlie Brown heads mounted above her stern. Sorry. 
Also, Gunfucker was totally nude. <laughs> the Amazonian warrioress, who had been standing serenely with her eyes closed, slowly opened them. They were ice blue, setting off nicely the near-white blonde of her hair, which fell loosely about her shoulders and halfway down to her previously mentioned fine, fine ass. <laughs> She gazed unblinking at Gunfucker, her eyes shooting daggers. Metaphorical ones. Thank Christ she apparently hadn't had cyborg optic dagger launchers installed yet. She leveled her katana at him. And the crowd hushed to a dull murmur. Prometheus Gunfucker, she exhorted, loudly yet softly. Masculine yet feminine. I am Hera Shavencleft. You killed my father at the Battle of Rifthaven. You killed his brother at the Second Battle of Rifthaven. You killed their father at the memorial service for the fallen soldiers of First and Second Rifthaven. And you fucked my mother and my four sisters at the Rifthaven Marriott Grand Marquis. Today, I am going to kill you. I am going to kill you super dead. So fucking dead you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to murder every single part of you. Your eyes, your heart, your blood, your balls, your hair, your feet. You're that thing between your nose and lips that I can never remember the name of. Your house. Your toothbrush, your goddamn name, maybe even your dog if you have one, but not your cat if you have a cat, because I like cats. You get the general idea, I think. Anyway, get ready to die, scum shit. The crowd erupted, and side bets flew anew. Soon a buzzer sounded, signaling the imminent start of the match. Prometheus Gunfucker looked out at the woman across from him and how she was totally kitted out. He looked down at himself with no weapon, no armor, nothing but his legendary huge veiny cock to swing. He looked back up at his opponent and weighed his options. This was going to take some serious negging.